Hi, Katie. Hi, Eric. Hi, and thank you, Kay. Um, so I'm Katie Martin. I'm the markets editor at the Financial Times in London, and I'm here today to chat to Eric Lonergan, who I'm sure a lot of you know already and needs little introduction. He is um, a macro fund manager and an economist, and he's also an author now. He's just put out Angrynomics with Mark Blythe, talking about popular anger, where it comes from, how it can be harnessed for good or ill, um, and it's a discussion of inequality and politics and lots of other things besides. Eric's going to talk to us about some of his arguments, and you're very welcome to ask questions on screen. You can use the Q&A function. Um, once Eric has uh, presented his, uh, his thoughts, we're going to have a chat, and then we'll address some of the questions that you, you post on the screen. So, Eric, take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen and put some slides up. So, Katie, hopefully, you can you see those okay? I can see it. Right. <laughs> it's definitely there. <laughs> well, I'm going to try and keep this reasonably short and, and really just convey some of the kind of core ideas in the book and go through a sort of vocabulary or lexicon of anger that I think is quite helpful to understanding what's going on in the world currently. Um, so the first thing I'll do is, is have a look at this sort of typology of anger. One of the big challenges, uh, if you look into the issue of anger, is the literature on anger spans a vast array of disciplines. So there's work in neuroscience, there's work in moral philosophy dating all the way back to Aristotle. There's work in social psychology, political science about you know, the voting behavior of angry people. So you have this huge disparate literature. Um, and we've tried in the book to kind of synthesize um, what a lot of us assume we understand. We all assume we know what anger is, but actually we're not very articulate when it comes to, to, to analyzing it. The second thing I want to look at is some sort of looking at the pandemic is there anything we can say about the medium term? Um, and I have some suggestions and thoughts, and it'll be very interesting to hear what the response to those are in, in the Q&A. And then finally, and this is a key part of the book, is I think as, as with my kind of pure economist hat on, there's actually some huge economic opportunities or low hanging fruit for the global economy which is really just a failure of the mind that we're not exploiting. And I want to try and quickly go through some of those ideas, which people, particularly this audience, may resonate. Okay, so the first thing, the typology of anger, everybody knows what it is. So even children get angry. Uh, any human being that has lived uh, and is conscious is going to understand this emotion. Does anyone understand it? And, and what I would think about that is, is, is I, for one, until I started to look into this subject in a lot of detail, hadn't really given a lot of thought to why human beings get angry. What function does it serve? You know, is there good anger? Is there bad anger? What does it tell us about a human being uh, when they get angry and why do they do it? Um, and the journey proved to be illuminating. So the first thing that, that came across was we, we developed a typology of uh, really sort of four types, which is there's public and private is the first big distinction. Um, so, and, and all of these different types of anger appear to almost have opposites. So there's a kind of devilish and angelic form of each type of anger. Um, and so the first opposition is between public anger and private anger. Those seem to us to be very, very different phenomena, and hopefully that will become clear in this discussion. And then within public anger, which is kind of, the, I think, the easiest form of anger to analyze in some sense, there are two very clear types, which is the anger of devils, which is represented here, uh, and the anger of angels, which I'll come on to discuss briefly. Now, what is the anger of devils? Well, a kind of critical moment in the genesis of, of, of this sort of view of the world was when Mark and I, Mark, my, my co-author, who's a professor at Brown University, we did a big data search using uh, IBM's uh, Watson Analytics, and we aggregated news stories around the subject of anger. And the real surprise was the second most frequent type of story involved uh, stories about sports fans. And this really was a bit of a light bulb moment for me because we suddenly started to reflect why is it that 
there's always at any major sporting event, or particularly if you go to football matches, uh, there's a small minority of fans who get really angry. Um, and it's very curious in many ways. Why do people pay good money to travel often to watch really bad games of football in pretty miserable conditions uh, to get angry? Um, and I started watching fans when I went to football matches. And I realized one of the interesting features, and this is why this picture is very relevant, is if you look at the sort of center point of the dispute or the anger here is actually two individuals wearing red shirts. I think they're actually on the same side. And this is a key insight into the function of what we describe as tribal energy, which is anger almost solves a collective action problem, which is when a group feels threatened in, in evolution, presumably to do with the scarcity of resources, we need to form groups in order to go to war. And war is a kind of collective action problem because you know the, 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 there'll always be free riding, which is you might as well send somebody else out to the front line rather than yourself. So there seems to be this kind of anger seems to serve as a mechanism to create tribalism. Um, and this is really an important component. So the first type of anger that we observe was this kind of the angry fan. And that is the, the anger of devils because the historical function of this is really clear, which is this is a precursor to tribal violence. And we have instances, if you look in the literature, say in social psychology of, I mean, sports fans, we know there can be violence at, at sporting events, but if you look historically, thousands of human beings would get uh, killed in, in appalling brutality that often followed uh, sporting events if you go back uh, thousands of years. So this, the, the anger of devil, devils, which is a, a, a a tribal energy is the first part of the typology. What is the second side? The second side is actually more recognized within the, the philosophy literature. So Aristotle talked about, and, and the Greek philosophers, and this has been updated in contemporary US moral philosophy by people like Martha Nussbaum, is the idea of appropriate response to a perception of injustice. And again, this is fascinating. This is almost the opposite of tribal rage. So anger seems to be a regulator, a signal that an injustice is occurring. So it's actually a prerequisite for our, the establishment of morality and norms. And yet its other face is actually amoral aggression, which is uh, tribal energy. And I've put Cornell West here, where if, if you haven't seen, there's a great interview with him during the Black Lives Matters protests where he's on CNN. And I was really struck by one of the arguments that he made, which is he was saying, um, why, you know, what would it say about our society if we witnessed this level of police brutality and there weren't people on the streets? And that's actually an Aristotelian argument uh, in the context of moral philosophy, which is Aristotle would say, anger at injustice is an appropriate response, right? So it is somehow almost an ethical response. So we have these two very different faces of public anger. Now, what about private um, anger or stress? And this is really, really interesting because if we think of the first two types of the, the public anger, particularly if you think of moral outrage or in moral indignation, it's almost cognitive. I mean, you know, if you were to stop an Extinction Rebellion uh, protester and say, why are you angry? They will give you very good reasons. And there's almost pride because it's, it's in, in that sense, it's an appropriate response. They should be ang angry. In the private sphere, anger is very, very different. And very often, not, not uniformly, but very often, it's a manifestation of something that's, something that's causing stress for the individual. Um, so, for example, if, you, if one had a colleague at work who was getting angry, um, you're much more likely to take them to one side and say, is everything okay at home? Maybe something's happened in their life and they're really struggling to cope. So what's fascinating here, in a sense, is that although we have public anger is righteous indignation in one of its, in its angelic form, in the private sphere, anger is typically telling us about some degree of stress. And what's interesting here in the context of our kind of applying this then to political economy and trying to understand our politics is you can almost see a macro anger and a micro anger. And so we're interested when we look at the world about, first of all, 
um, this vocabulary will hopefully help us navigate what's happening with populism because we think populist, the dangerous side of populism is absolutely the attempt to target tribal rage um, because this actually is functional if you want to win elections. It's not functional ultimately for the survival of societies, but it is for, for electioneering. And we want to kind of respond to legitimate concerns about ethics and then we want to try and identify what is going on in the private sphere where there seems to be an, epi an epidemic of aspects, issues like mental illness, um, anxiety, stress, and is there in any sense an economic cause of this phenomenon? Okay, now, I, I, before I go on to some of the sort of policy ideas in the book, we've kind of created this lexicon. Why has tribalism in particular risen to the fore currently? And I think one of the ideas in the book that may be interesting people to, to people to make sense of this is we think about it in terms of the vested interests of the political class and also the media. So if you think as an economist, when you look at politicians, you, you, your, your instinct is to say, well, what is their incentive? They're trying to get elected. And so what are they going to do in order to get elected? And the most articulate representation, I think, of populism is actually Viktor Orban in Hungary, because he epitomizes the, thesis, the argument that we make, which is we think that, in a sense, what happened with the end of the Cold War and this consensus at the center about the role of markets and um, you know, the great moderation, outsourcing macro policy to central banks, um, this created a, an identity vacuum in politics. So in the Cold War era, there were motivating ideologies. And we lost our motivating ideology within the political sphere. And so what happened is, is politicians with the objective of motivating a minority in order to win an election reverted to the age old motivator, which is tribal energy. And part of the anger that we see is being actively exploited. The perfect representation of this is Trump, who has this extraordinary intelligence native intelligence where he will literally use ethical arguments I mean, straight out of Greek philosophy, believe it or not, when he goes to the Rust Belt. He even uses the word, I am your voice. I mean, voice for somebody wronged is an ethical idea. I mean, people who are affected by a wrongdoing deserve representation. That's an ethical argument. He will go on about deindustrialization, that people have been ignored, what's happened, their incomes have stagnated. And then he will effortlessly move to a constituency where there is racial tension and start talking about marauding Mexicans and building walls. And then if you apply that to political science, you realize, well, he wins elections by motivating 80,000 people. Angry people are more likely to vote. And if he can target that minority of angry fans, you can win elections. And suddenly you go from a relatively abstract observations about anger to a very clear political strategy, which is actually highly effective. Okay, so how do I see the pandemic in this context? I, I think, and I don't want to take, take up too much time before we, we, we have Q&A, because that will be more interesting. But th the simple observation I would make, you know, I, I guess in, in my professional day job, a lot of what I do is trying to understand crises and what the effects of them are. And I think probably I've come to the conclusion that the only observation that's probably worth giving a reasonably high weight to is the idea that the post-pandemic is greater than pre-pandemic. That's my kind of simple code for it. And what I really mean by that is usually crises accelerate trends that were occurring previously. So I think we can see this with the financial crisis. And I think of it as an economist, even lower real interest rates, um, you know, growing central banks, balance sheets, certain types and patterns of asset price behavior. But also, I think in politics, you can see nationalism already starting to emerge, things like Scottish nationalism. There are lots of the, the Lega in Italy before the financial crisis. And then what happened after the financial crisis was these things accelerated. And I think we see that again with the pandemic. If you look at the diffusion of technology, there's clearly been an acceleration in the trend which has sort of sectoral effects in our economy. I think we see an acceleration in the trend within macroeconomic policy as well, with real interest rate structures, central banks balance sheets. I think the inflation trend as well. And, I'm, and I think the, the tension within our politics has become even greater. So there will be a tendency, we're already seeing it, uh, to make this uh, pandemic 
some, some, somehow nationalistic. I think we're already seeing attempts to do that, and that will be the attempt of parts of our political class in order to exploit it. So that, in a sense, is the diagnosis in, 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 as, as quickly and as, as synthetically as I can. What uh, do we propose? And, and part of what the book tries to do is look at a history of capitalism, kind of pre-war, post-war, and then the era of neoliberalism. So you kind of had you know, unbridled free market capitalism pre-war. Then you have a kind of post-war New Deal and synthesis um, at least, you know, on, on one side of the Cold War. And then you have the era of, of neoliberalism. And, and what, in a sense, we've observed is what's curious about the great financial crisis is there hasn't been a reprogramming of capitalism. The tensions that were caused have really continued to this day. And that's a contrast with the previous eras. So we've tried to contribute to a new code. And so we have three acronyms, N NWFs, Teltros, and and DDSs, and the idea there is that we really think that there's a consensus, a kind of the silent majority has a huge consensus around environmental sustainability, wealth and income inequality, um, and ending recessions. I think those are the kind of undisputed areas of moral uh, outrage which need to be addressed. Um, where there is a huge overwhelming consensus. And in a sense, the challenge for our politics is to translate those three areas, which is you know, sustainability in, in the broader sense, but, but principally with respect to the environment, um, ending recessions and keeping the, the, co the costs of recessions as low as possible, and then trying to tackle uh, issues around the distribution of assets. So the three ideas we have, to put it very simply, and we can discuss them in more detail, I put here national wealth funds, which is an idea that the state has an extraordinary opportunity on its balance sheet currently, which is most of the developed world can borrow at negative real interest rates for up to 30 years. Now, arithmetically, and this audience will understand it, if my cost of capital is negative real, anything, any investment I make with a positive real return creates net present value, right? And I, I pull my hair out when I read, the IMF just came out with an appalling piece of analysis about public sector debt. Any balance sheet analysis, you look at net assets, right? If the government is issuing debt and buying the debt, its debt hasn't gone up. So central banks have actually monetized somewhere between 20 and 30% of all the debt that's been, in, of, of the stock of debt, outstanding. But anyway, so what I'm proposing here is that your net assets would immediately go up Right, so it, literally, if the government issued 15% of GDP in 30-year government bonds at negative real interest rates, and then effectively set up an independent authority to manage that wealth, and ran it like the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund or the Harvard Endowment or the Wellcome Trust in the UK, we have these great, great, many, 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 many more. Uh, and you know, you put it out to tender, you do it competitively. There's absolutely no reason why the, the uh, uh, over a 15 or 20 year period, a, a four to 6% real return won't be generated. Well, the excess return there of somewhere, anywhere between four and 8% effectively means over 15 to 20 years, you can repay the debt and, and, and retain the assets. So I think there's a unique opportunity to do something about, and then distribute potentially ownership in those assets to people within society who don't have assets as a kind of uh, you know, national inheritance. The other idea is dual interest rates. And I think this, some of you will be aware, but this is something uh, I've written an awful lot on uh, about this. Um, and, and, and there's been interesting discussions on, 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 in the FT and elsewhere, but I still think it's been undercovered. This is what the ECB has done. And it is, it is an absolute game changer uh, within the context of central banking. I think Philip Lane may be the most underestimated uh, central banker in history currently, because this is a profound innovation. Effectively, what it means is the ECB has raised interest rates on deposits and cut interest rates on loans. As soon as you think about that, you realize that means you have no limit. There is no excuse for central banks not hitting inflation targets and generating nominal demand. The way I think that could be cleverly used in a European context is provide, do a Teltro at minus 5%, um, you know, for uh, five to 10 years conditional on those loans being extended to renewable energy and you will create a boom in the re renewable energy industry. So we can absolutely supercharge this recovery into a green recovery. 
And then we have other ideas that are associated with effectively trying to make cash transfers to individuals, which are a sort of variant on a universal basic, basic income that I think solves some of the, the challenges there. I realize I've probably already gone on for too long and I will end it on that note. Sorry, Katie. No, no, no need to apologize. It's, um, it's interesting stuff. And, and remember, do post your questions in the Q&A box if you have any. One, one thought that occurs to me is that one aspect of anger is it's incredibly difficult to back down from. And it's difficult to admit that you were angry about the wrong things. Do you think that is a factor in this reluctance to use the incredibly cheap borrowing that's available to governments out there? It's a huge amount of egg on people's faces to say, actually, let's just borrow you know, all this kind of decades that they've been telling us it's the wrong thing to do. How do you climb down? I mean, that's a great question. And nobody has asked me that. Um, and, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, the irony is, I think, one of the ways that populists can charm electorates or try to is at least appearing to be honest or, or and even being transparently in their dishonesty um, and i think one of the the skills i think our current politicians do have is an ability to change direction and try and take credit for it so i'm less worried about that but but you also raise i think at, at the personal level i think as well and probably with respect to moral outrage, one of the things I found very interesting was in the whole Cummings episode, not to make it too unique to the UK, but we have this case where a UK government advisor effectively breaks the lockdown rules. And I think you also, you very clearly saw moral outrage. Now I must say, I think they were ill-advised because as children learn, um, one way to deal with moral rebuke is to apologize. Um, and I actually think people are very responsive if they believe the apology. We haven't, we, there, is a, there is a get out clause if you make a big mistake in ethics. You have to recognize it though, because if you don't recognize it, you might do it again and, and your community won't let you. So, I mean, as you said that, you know, well, as you suggest at least, that there seems to be a, you know, a bull market in anger everywhere. And part of that is because bad actors, cynical actors, have become incredibly skilled at harnessing anger. How does, how does the center harness anger? Can it, can it be done or is it, does it just clash with centrist politics? So again, so that's a really interesting question. I, I don't like to talk about centrist politics because in a way, you know, I don't aspire to be centrist. I, I think the aspiration should be to be right. It's a bit like investing. You know, uh, you know, as Warren Buffett says, there's no style at, at Berkshire Hathaway, just smart. You know, I, I don't, I'm genuinely, and I guess probably even more so having written the book and seeing things, our propensity to form groups. I'm very allergic to trying to place a, place a view on whether, you know, a lot of people want to start with, is that left or right or center? You know, let's start with whether it's a good idea or not. So I think the first thing in a sense is we probably need to get away from that idea. I think the opportunity for politics is to go back to where there is ethical motivation. That's the only way to fight tribalism is with something else, a positive motivator. And the positive motivator is people care enormously about the sustainability of the environment. But you, we need to show people that we've got positive solutions. It doesn't require a huge amount of sacrifice. It's actually the basis of industrial policy and means upskilling you know, more manufacturing jobs, more sustainable economic growth, better air quality, we can, and better human capital, lower unemployment, higher rates of investment spending. That's the story that needs to be behind it. Um, and we can do a huge amount on providing people with more stable income, with higher levels of income, and with more wealth ownership. Um, one more for me before we um, turn over some of the questions that are coming through. Something again that you touch on in the book is, is climate change. And a green finance revolution is, as, as you say, a huge opportunity in a lot of ways. In the event that we fail to deal with it, however, which isn't beyond the realms of possibility, I mean, the, the wave of anger that could be coming our way through a mishandling of the climate crisis must just be on a different order of magnitude to anything we've seen before, taking into account 08, taking into account the potential negative ramifications of the policy response to the pandemic. 
climate change would be something else. I mean, as, as we know, immigration, rightly or wrongly, is a huge a set of fuel for anger and the sorts of movement of people around the world that we're going to see if we get this climate question wrong is just, it just, it beggars me. So, yeah, what's at stake in terms of what could happen politically if we screw up the climate question? I mean, I think it's huge. So, so again, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about this and I don't have the answer and I don't, I'm not aware of research on it, but part of me has almost thought, I particularly, you know, why do we have this tribal rage? Why, why do human beings have this propensity? It must have at least served to function at some point. And, and the logical idea is that it's associated with scarce resources. And this is precisely, if you look at the narratives on immigration, are all about trying to say somehow, these you're worse off because of this other group right um but and and the climate crisis will create scarcity and the creation of scarcity i think is is where the propensity and narratives to trigger tribal identity rage and violence ultimately come from um but i i don't i just think this th this is an opportunity so, so i get you know the fundamental message i would have on the environment is that we're incredibly lucky because of two things we can borrow at negative real interest rates for 30 years, and we have the need to do a vast amount of capital expenditure. We're the luckiest generation. We're just currently behaving like idiots. <laughs> that makes me angry. <laughs> Good to see you're not above anger yourself. Um, so one of the questions that t has come in is around the idea that you outlined earlier of a, a UK national wealth fund. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that might work? One of my favorite things on the internet is the Norwegian national wealth fund. If you look it up online, it has this massive number across the screen that says, this is how much money we have. And it's just this enormous number of digits that just seems to rattle up the whole time. It's, it's incredible. I mean, what, what, I totally agree. how could this work? Yeah, so okay, well, the other thing I think is fascinating is if you look at their returns, and I th think two things. I think on average they've generated 6% return, but I think also a huge amount of its current value is return. That's the key point. I don't know if it's 40 or 50% or which side of 50% it is, but it's, it's of that order of magnitude. So what's really interesting is people go, oh, yeah, but, you know, they had oil. Well, they've generated, you compound, you know, over 20 years at 6%, uh, and it's huge. And that is, it is as simple as that, right? The, the, the madness at the moment, and again, this is where I, I do wish, and I speak as an economist, that, that as economists, one of the things we try to do with our the policy ideas is they have to be things that can be done quickly and effectively. And, and, and economists spend way too much time on what's optimal rather than what's possible. Right? And, and what I like about a national wealth fund is we all go, um, if I can borrow negative real, I should be doing investment spending. So everybody says, why doesn't the UK government or the, the, the Irish government, or the Italian government, Portugal, everywhere, why aren't we, Germany, why aren't we doing huge investment spending? Well, because investment spending takes, takes quite a lot of time and there's a whole lot of hurdles to go through. So I'm all in favor of it, let's do it. But in the interim, can we just take advantage of these negative real interest rates, okay? So all I'm saying is uh, set up an endowment, a national endowment, but debt finance it because you could borrow you know, with 30 year maturities, you could issue zero coupons for 30 years and then just put it out to tender, have proper governance. I mean, it'd be fantastic. You have a, have a sovereign wealth fund. Look at best practice, best practice on oversight, best practice on the ESG requirements, become a great stakeholder globally in trying to improve corporate governance and setting benchmarks for what constitutes the best practice. And in the interim, you know, create lots and lots of assets for your population because we have a very curious situation at the moment where the return on private assets is very high and the private sector is willing to lend to the state uh, and pay them uh, for the issuance of bonds. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, what a time to be alive, right? Um, one of the, uh, the other subjects that comes into your book that someone's um, posted a question about is about a data dividend for big tech. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so this is probably the, I, I think, requires a lot, an awful lot more work. I mean, I think the, the concept of dual interest rates, cash transfers to households from central banks, and national wealth fund, frankly, I think the work has been done. I mean, I just think we should get on with it and do them. Um, the data dividend is trying to tackle two issues. One is there is a lot of resistance to a basic income, a lot of which I think is framing the idea that people get something for nothing, a lot of people have resistance to. 
And so we thought, well, what can we do about these kind of enormously successful global technology businesses? Is there a sense, it's a bit like with the National Wealth Fund, where some degree of ownership is an alternative to trying to tax them, which seems to be incredibly hard. Um, but also there's a deep irony because they have monopolistic characteristics. And in fact, their value resides on something that we own, which is data. So it's actually collectively owned. And so is there a case for simply saying, well, because this is obviously an, a, a challenge in global trade, let's just exercise our property rights. So if you look at it on a national basis and you say, we have data, our population has a stock of data and is going to generate more data. We're going to exercise our property right and effectively auction it. And then that then the proceeds of that auction could then be very cleverly used. So you could either generate a, an income stream for parts of your population who have low incomes and may not have assets um, effectively through the exercise of our collective property rights. Would it not be easier for them to just pay some tax? <laughs> Well, it's very interesting, you know, I, it's funny because when I started in markets, you know, I trained as an economist and thought it was all about economics. And then uh, 20 years later, I think it's all about psychology. Um, and I think framing is part of political effect. You know, it's like those wonderful neoclassical models that sort of tells you nothing ever makes any difference anyway. Um, and, and so, because all balance sheets net to zero and everything turns out fine in the end. I mean, I think, I, I think there's something to be said for labeling things. And I, I, I don't have a problem with us going, we actually do own the data. So why don't we just exercise our property, right? That feels to me, you get it, that's far less contentious in some ways then what's the best tax rate? You also don't get away from the huge coordination problem with tax rates um, for global businesses. Well, one very thoughtful question that's come in here, I guess is about the unintended consequences of trying to soothe anger. Um, to, around this idea of national wealth funds, how could that be applied in the US um, without sparking a debate about reparations issue in the US. So you would just end up potentially stoking the reflexive anger of white Americans. That's a question that's come in here. Have you thought about how dealing with today's inequalities, if you like, could just stir up debates about older inequalities and make the whole situation worse? Yeah, I guess one of the interesting sort of tensions in the book was between myself and Mark, actually. I think Mark thinks of inequality more of a cause than I do. So, so I, I'm in favor of sort of addressing inequality as a positive agenda, right? So I think you can create a positive politics that says, you know, in a sense, free market capitalism, you can actually have a stake in it. So, so we, we sh it is a dysfunctional society where 90% of the wealth is concentrated in the hands of 1%. That's objectively dysfunctional. And there are really straightforward ways where we can make a big difference to the 30, 50, 80% of the population that really doesn't have much by way of asset ownership. And I, I, I kind of feel that's the real, I think that is uh, very, very doable and an overriding objective. Another interesting question here is, I guess around how anger can coalesce again around relatively new movements and ideas so that the Me Too movement brought renewed attention to the efficacy of feminist anger. Have you done any examination of how anger lives and exists within within different groups? And I guess that reminds me of, you know, we do see anger amongst groups of people who previously have been quite liberal and quite and and quite quiet and voiceless. So you look at the the Brexit protests, there are you know, people out on the streets who've never protested about anything in their lives. You have yeah. the Me Too movement, people, you know, women who've put up with poor treatment for years and have never said anything about it. How does that work within the structure of, of race and sexuality and gender and lots of other things in addition to class? I think it works extraordinarily well as a typology, right? So I would say in all of those debates, without taking sides, I can just categorize the arguments and the angers. So I can, I can identify, um, I mean, I, 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 yeah, in, in all of those debates, I think there's both a tribal rage component and there's an ethical outrage. So for example, take Brexit, there's absolutely an ethical moral outrage. 
which has come from both the left and the right, um, which is about democratic legitimacy. And that's a longstanding argument. Mehreen Khan, um, your colleague indeed, I, I know was, was made that argument. I always held it up as the kind of ethical case. And, but there are lots of people, in, you know, that might be, that would be your interpretation of, of a Jacob Rees-Mogg version. But then, of course, you have the pure tribal, you have the Farage, whether it's implicit or explicit, and you may mix the two, but there's absolutely the kind of nod to the sports fan tribal national identity type argument. And I think the, uh, you know, the Me Too movement, absolutely. And, and this is where, you know, it's very interesting because Diane Coyle has written a really great review of the book, a very interesting review, but quite a, critical on this point that we don't address the issue of gender. Um, and, I, and it's a cop out to say, well, you know, we're, we're two white men, so it's, we should probably keep quiet on that subject. You know, uh, I, I think I'm still allowed to call myself a feminist, um, you know, my, I, you know for, for all the obvious reasons. And, and the interesting thing was we, we, we were, we're aware of it. There's only a small amount of literature on it. And I found it a bit, a bit too stereotyping. So I don't like just saying this is male. I mean, I think the tribal rage appears to have a strong male dimension to it, but moral outrage, absolutely not. That's not the, 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 the uh, you know, the purvey of, of any group. I think that's universal, which is also why it's a, there's optimism there. And the Me Too movement is moral outrage, right? It's that in, injustice and discrimination um, and unregulated abusive behavior. Um, so that is a, a good example of moral outrage. Um. One um, other interesting question that's come through here is around um, social media platforms and, and the role that they play in building tribalism and in, in building anger. Lots of very clever people have written very eloquently about this about this subject, but you know, what what do you think can be done to to counter that or to get them to take responsibility for it? They're, they're making baby steps in that direction, but it's yes but it's slow and the situation in, in some regards is quite urgent. I think it's holding, it's, this is a cliche, but it's, I think it's holding up a mirror to us. So, so the, the thing I think we should do about this is every school, school children need to learn one thing from social psychology, which is what's called the minimal groups um, theorem. And this is just the idea, they did experiments in the 60s with groups of children. And, and they expect, they divided a class into who prefers the artist Clay to the artist Kandinsky, right? So anyone familiar, there's not a, not a huge amount of distinction between the two. You divide the room based on this arbitrary distinction and they will virtually go to war, right? So, so our propensity to form groups uh, is very, very profound and, and, and we do it effortlessly and we're not self-aware. So, so it's all very well, you know, we can talk about all these terrible people on Twitter and then, this, and, and then we will flip back into our little group. Um, and so, you know, I, the irony here is you see it with economics, you know, whether it's new Keynesians, old Keynesians, MMT, they're all, they're, they're, there's a, this tribalism. Um, it's, 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 there's, and the, half of the time it's like trying to find the differences and argue over them in order to identify um, so the first thing we've got to do is, is just beware that you think you're identifying with the group because somehow you're on the side of angels, but it's as much about just a totally arbitrary uh, consolation from, and the, you know, and, and this you, you, people realize in markets, you know, and unfortunately, uh, by, by doing what the group does, uh, you're very often proven to be wrong. Yeah, you're right. It, it... People, you know, you get perma bears who are who are bearish no matter what, and it's very you, again, it's very difficult to admit that you got that wrong. And you get you you get you get perma bulls. You have you have doves and you have hawks and you you do have these camps. Yeah. I, however, am right about everything. So as long as well, we I'm saying, I mean, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm not in a tribe. I'm just right about that. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, it's been a fascinating discussion and thanks so much for for sharing your brain and good luck with your book and thanks to everyone who put the questions in i hope eric has managed to answer them to your satisfaction if not you can get angry about it um, thanks <laughs> thanks eric. On twitter yeah. Casey, thank you very very much that, that was really great i really enjoyed it thank you pleasure pleasure likewise just want to come on to thank Katie and Eric for this time uh, and just remind everyone that this recording will be available on your iConnections dashboard in the coming days. 
Funds for Food is proudly supported by industry leaders who come together to make this event possible. We thank them for their support. Registrations are still open and we all look forward to seeing some of you at our charity webinar on July 1st. Thank you.